All right, good morning, everybody, and welcome to our webinar on sickle cell disease and kidney health. My name is Jacob Hendergrast. I go by he, him, and I am a member of the Educational Committee of the Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario, and I'll be moderating today's session. If you or members of your network would like to refer back to the information shared in the session, a recording of today's session will be posted on our website, which is sicklecellanemia.ca, and you can view that at your convenience. And one of our missions at SCAGO is to serve as a conduit for members of our community to access evidence-based up-to-date information, like what we have prepared this morning. And today's session is important because we know that kidney disease is something that becomes increasingly important in sickle cell disease as patients age. And I'm an adult hematologist at the University Health Network. And we do increasingly see uh, all sorts of ways that sickle cell disease manifests in the kidney, starting from the very subtle abnormalities that you might see in a urine uh, sample, all the way to people who end up requiring dialysis and transplantation support. And so our hope with today's session is to improve everyone's understanding of how sickle cell disease affects the kidney and what it is that we need to do to monitor for those complications and manage them appropriately. So in this session, we're gonna be hearing primarily uh, from two nephrologists. One is Dr. Isvan Mucci, and he is an associate professor at the University of Health uh, Network, where I also work, and he's part of the kidney transplant program. And he also works in the Ajmerit Transplant Center and in addition to this, we will be joined by Dr. Uh, Pearl uh, Nakimera Masembe, who's a medical doctor from Uganda, and who believes that a patient care should be a physician's first priority. And she works at Buganda Medical Center in Mwanza, Tanzania. She holds a medical degree from Qingdao University and a master's of medicine from Nanjing Medical University in China, where she completed her postgraduate specialization in the field of nephrology. So I'd like to begin today just with a land acknowledgement and some housekeeping rules. And after that, we'll have our presentations from our guest speakers, and which will include some interactivity, and then there'll be a more open question and answer session at the end. I do ask that you save your questions and thoughts and concerns and that sort of thing. Um, until the end of our, our session so that we can have that sort of open discussion, uh, although there will be some polls integrated into the presentation today and you'll be able to participate that way. Um, in terms of just general housekeeping, your microphones have been disabled for the duration of the seminar, um, but if you'd like to ask a question, uh, feel free to submit something in the chat uh, function of the Zoom call and we'll try to keep uh, track of those and come back to them afterwards. Um, if there's anything urgent, we can interrupt if we need to. Closed captioning is provided. When you're in the chat session, uh, please do use respectful language, uh, avoid profanity or any kind of inappropriate images or posts, um, and do not post any material unrelated to today's discussion topic. And we'll try to keep ourselves focused on the issue at hand, which is, which is kidney disease. I will emphasize that uh, while this is an educational session, this is not intended to serve as a source or supplement of medical advice regarding anyone's particular medical condition. Um, so in regards to the, the land acknowledgements, um, I know we have people joining us from uh, a large number of areas in the country. I'm not sure if we have people outside of the country, but I'm going to focus the land acknowledgement just on the, uh, the city of Toronto where we are all currently located. And so we acknowledge that the land we are meeting on is the traditional territory of many nations, including the Mississaugas of the Credit, uh, the Anishwabe, the Chippewa, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples, and is now home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We also acknowledge that Toronto is covered by Treaty 13 with the Mississaugas of the Credit. So uh, without further ado, good morning speakers and thank you for joining us today. And we'll begin, I believe, with uh, Dr. Mushi. 
Good morning and good afternoon, everybody, for, for those who, who are joining us from outside of uh, Canada. Uh, I'm Istvan Muchi. Uh, I'm a transplant nephrologist at the University Health Network uh, from the Jumeirah uh, Transplant Center. Um, today, we will be talking about uh, kidney health and kidney disease as it relates to uh, sickle cell disease, but also a little bit more general about kidney disease uh, and chronic kidney disease progression and uh, the various treatments that can be done. Uh, I will be joined by two co-speakers. You uh, you may have uh, heard about this, and then I, I'm uh, just uh, pointing this out now. Uh, Dr. Masamba from Tanzania, where it's kind of getting evening right now, slowly. Uh, she will be talking about pediatric uh, aspects of sickle cell disease and kidney disease. And Ajina Qureshi uh, is one of our summer students at UHM who will be talking about um, our next steps in, in trying to provide information about kidney health and kidney disease for uh, patients and, and communities from uh, with African Caribbean or Black uh, ancestry and heritage. And uh, we very much will uh, looking be looking forward to your questions and, and suggestions about that, that website, but also about the, the talk today and the discussion around kidney health and kidney disease. We need to know what is important for you. What do you need to know? What do you think differently from, from what is happening in the kidney health um, care system at this point uh, as you experience that? So that's uh, my kind of brief introduction. Uh, I, I, I'm leading the Kidney Health Education Research Group at the University Health Network, where I mentioned that uh, Algina is currently doing a summer studentship and hopefully uh, Pearl might join us as a PhD student in the near future. Um, and we have three major directions and goals in this, uh, in this group. We are doing research to understand barriers and, and uh, inequities that people from various uh, racialized and marginalized communities face when they want to to uh, get kidney health uh, care. And also we are trying to uh, work with the government agencies and professionals and communities to improve kidney uh, transplant and kidney health education in Ontario. And lastly, uh, a, a branch of our research work is focusing on psychosocial and mental health issues as it related to chronic kidney disease, uh, organ transplant and kidney transplant. This talk will be uh, fairly kind of uh, uh, dense. Uh, there is a number of topics that we will discuss here. Uh, first, I will briefly introduce what the kidneys do, how they do, look, uh, how do they look, and and um, why do why do we need them? Uh, and then we will be talking about kidney disease, chronic kidney disease. What happens uh, if the kidneys are damaged and uh, their function is declining? Uh, we will then put that, in, uh, that into, in the context of, of uh, sickle cell disease, and uh, Pearl will be talking about um, uh, how uh, sickle cell disease may interfere with kidney function in children, and then we will continue uh, kidney health in patients with sickle cell disease in adults. Um, as uh, Dr. Pendergrass mentioned, this is an increasingly recognized issue. And uh, we then return to treatment of uh, kidney failure, uh, primarily focusing on uh, kidney transplantation and, and why is it important to think and, and know about kidney transplantation, even if um, your kidneys are not affected. Um, and finally, we will end up uh, this discussion uh, with, with um, um, a brief kind of a summary of uh, how the diversity in Ontario and in Toronto um, is seen from a kidney lens, how uh, the diverse communities in, in Ontario experience potentially different uh, kidney health care. And then uh, Ajina will, will present our plans to uh, potentially help uh, uh, people from African Caribbean and Black communities to uh, get a trusted information about kidney health. So uh, what are the kidneys? What do they do? Um, as a nephrologist, uh, obviously, I'm, I'm very intrigued by the kidneys. I very much uh, 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 admire both the, the very complex function that they do and the beautiful structure uh, that, uh, that uh, they have. Uh, as, as you know, we have two kidneys, which are more or less the size of our fists. And uh, the kidneys are located uh, at the lower part of our back um, on both sides. 
And they have a very intricate, very delicate structure that is uh, uh, depicted here. And I'm just trying to activate my pointer. And I think you, I hope you, you see my laser pointer. So uh, these are the two kidneys. Uh, the, uh, there are one artery for most kidneys and one vein, and the ureter drains out the urine from the kidney. And that is um, one of the most important function of the kidney to, to clean the blood and produce urine. Um, and the way this does, the kidneys uh, do this is through kind of a very delicate structure. Each kidneys, uh, both kidneys have about 1 million tiny units, which are called nephrons, that, that are the uh, basic units of function in the kidney. And this is how they look in the right uh, lower uh, corner of the, the slide. So uh, it is a vascular structure. It, it is composed of tiny blood vessels uh, uh, form, forming a glomerulus. And this is where the filtration occurs. And then there is a tubing coming out from the nephron, which is surrounded by, again, by a, a very intricate uh, network of tiny blood vessels, arteries, and veins. The kidney is probably the uh, most densely uh, uh, vascularized organ in our body. And this is important because basically it also shows how important the function is that out of the five liter of blood that is running through our body every minute, uh, about half liter every minute runs through the kidneys. And this also points to, to the fact that the kidneys are particularly um, vulnerable to sickle cell disease uh, because when the blood flow is affected by the sickling of the, the uh, red cells, uh, when tiny vessels are potentially clogged by, by the sickling cells, uh, the kidney tissue uh, is, is going to be damaged and eventually the function uh, will uh, uh, be impaired. Again, to summarize, the kidneys are the main, one of the main function is to cleaning the blood, removing waste products, removing water, which is one of the byproduct or waste products of our metabolism. And if uh, the kidneys cannot remove it, uh, uh, our body will retain a lot of water and that will affect many other organs. Uh, the kidneys remove potassium and acid uh, from the blood and other many other toxins that we may or may not even know now, but uh, we know that if the kidneys are not working, these toxins get accumulated in the blood and we, it will make us eventually sick and quite sick. In addition to this function, the kidneys control the blood pressure. It's actually one of the, the central control unit that, uh, that controls how our blood pressure is. And uh, when the kidneys are uh, diseased, blood pressure control will be sometimes out of range. Um, also, the kidneys produce hormones that help uh, the bone marrow, the body, to produce blood. So if the kidney uh, function is weak, uh, uh, anemia will uh, occur. And again, that uh, will cause a lot of symptoms. And finally, the kidneys also produce hormones that helps, uh, help the bones stay strong. So uh, many patients who have kidney failure, they have significant bone disease and potentially bone, bone fractures as well. Uh, so uh, the kidneys do a lot of things. And so if they are uh, their function is impaired, if the kidneys are damaged, many of these functions or all of these functions will be impaired and uh, appropriate symptoms will appear. So it is important to know uh, what are the factors that uh, can potentially damage the kidneys? What, what are the risk factors uh, for kidney failure or kidney disease? And this is important to know because if you have one of these conditions, then you need to be more aware of your kidney function and you need to pay closer attention to make sure that your kidney function is, is uh, maintained and stable. Uh, one of the most frequent uh, causes of chronic kidney disease is diabetes. Um, also, uh, overweight or ob obesity puts extra strain on the kidney and uh, leads to kidney damage eventually. High blood pressure, very frequently together with, uh, with uh, diabetes and obesity, that's kind of a triad of, of, uh, of, of oops, kidney, uh, risk factors, that, sorry for that, that can uh, jointly damage the kidney. And of course, if you have more than one uh, risk factors, that, that uh, will lead to uh, bigger kidney damage. Smoking is uh, very unhealthy for many reasons, but also for the kidneys. 
Uh, if you have a history of kidney disease in the family, that's an other risk factor. Uh, these are the, the factors that are most frequently causing kidney failure in the society. But of course, as it was mentioned already, uh, if you have sickle, dis sickle cell disease, um, uh, that uh, has an impact on kidney function. Sometimes that, that impact is subtle and you may not have any symptoms and it may not lead to any major health uh, impairment. But uh, in about one in five patients, uh, sickle cell disease will cause uh, kidney failure, especially if it's combined with other factors. Uh, so what can we do uh, to um, prevent kidney disease or control it. It is important to know that uh, actually we may not know that we have kidney disease. Uh, early on, uh, kidney disease has no symptoms whatsoever. And even if the kidney function is lost uh, to 50 or 60% uh, out of the 100% normal, uh, you may not have any symptoms and you wouldn't know unless you look for it. Uh, usually, if you have kidney impairment, uh, the kidney disease or kidney damage doesn't go away completely, and in fact, it may progress and uh, lead to kidney failure. Uh, kidney failure, kidney disease can be treated, and kidney failure can be maintained, uh, but not not cannot be cured for most of the time if it's chronic. Um, and kidney failure is a severe life-threatening. Uh, uh, condition where you need kidney replacement treatment, which is dialysis or kidney transplantation to stay alive. So what can you do uh, if you don't have symptoms, if you don't feel that your kidneys are not working? Uh, you need to look for it, or you need to ask your healthcare team to look for it. And it's important to know that you need to have both a blood test and urine test to understand if your kidney is working fine or not. Um, so when you see your doctors, especially if you have any of the risk factors that we spoke about before, you need to make sure that both your blood pressure and blood sugar would be checked. And you need to have uh, tests for kidney function, um, uh, both from the blood, which is usually measured by creatinine, and the, the normal range is usually less than 100, 120. Uh, also from the creatinine, we... Um, calculate this uh, function, which is a characterization of kidney function. It's called estimated glomerular filtration rate, a brief, a briefly EGFR. And it should be less than 90 or at least uh, greater than six, uh, greater than 90 or greater than 60 uh, to, to be uh, considered to be uh, acceptable or normal kidney function. In addition to the blood testing, a protein in the urine also an early, is an old, early indicator uh, of kidney dysfunction. So that's why your blood and urine will need to be tested um, if you want to understand kidney function uh, sufficiently. So I mentioned this EGFR. Um, we know that the creatinine uh, measure from the blood is not quite accurate uh, representation of kidney function. So uh, in research, um, uh, nephrologists developed this very complex uh, uh, formula to calculate this estimated glomerular filtration rate, EGFR. And that gives you that range of 120 to 60 in the normal range. And usually we say that it's kind of a percentage of the kidney function, 100% is normal and less than 60% is uh, chronic uh, kidney disease, moderate degree. And importantly, and that's that's something that is relevant uh, probably most of the, to most of the audience as well, that in this formula from the research, uh, the researchers added a, a factor, uh, um, an, a component that would adjust for black race, black uh, ethnicity um, uh, in, in pro population studies. And it was used to uh, characterize kidney function in individuals in clinical care in the US, in Europe, and also uh, in Canada. Although in Canada, it was not systematically used because we don't have systematic information about racialized background of the uh, people. Now, this has been a matter of discussion in the last couple of years now, whether this uh, adjustment for uh, racialized or race status is, is justifiable or correct. And if you think about what race and or racialized status means, as, is a very complex concept. It's a social construct and not a biological one, although it may have some uh, uh, association with ancestry or genetic background. 
but primarily it reflects social, socioeconomic status. And also it reflects the person's uh, encounter with society and experiences with racism and discrimination. This has been discussed both in the US and in Canada as well. And from this understanding, uh, it has become clear that actually it is more racism and not the racialized status of race is the determinant of access to health and healthcare. And this is, uh, we did, we have been doing research uh, about uh, discrimination and about access to healthcare in the Black communities. And one of our participants uh, um, stated this, that it isn't how uh, we identify ourselves that affects how we get healthcare, but what affects us is how other people see us, how the healthcare system sees us. And that is actually really the a perspective that racism and, and the, the racialization is the determinant of access to health and healthcare and not uh, the race or the racialized category itself. Um, as a consequence of all these discussions in the last couple of years, this uh, uh, race adjustment has been removed from the formula, both in the United States. Uh, there has been a, a very detailed approach to this. And now uh, uh, there has been a discussion in medicine about how can this, this be approached. Um, uh, and now we kind of uh, state that the previous way to approach uh, racial inequities and disparities in healthcare is really actually contributed and maintained the racial health inequities because we, we have seen that although there has been discussion and research around this, uh, the situation hasn't changed. And now uh, people suggest, and this uh, article was written by Canadians uh, in, in the Canadian Medical Association Journal, and Karen pointed this paper out recently. Uh, now we, are, we need to engage in race, con race conscious medicine where we uh, think about how race impacts healthcare and access to healthcare, and uh, do research on the impact of racialization on healthcare. And also, uh, we provide additional support for communities that are affected. So, we will come back to this at the end because, as I mentioned, our group is doing research in this, and we try to provide or produce some of these support materials that could help uh, racialized uh, patients to get better healthcare than they are receiving now. Coming back to generally maintaining your kidney health and, and, and uh, keeping your kidneys healthy or happy as long as possible. Now, if you have any of the conditions that I mentioned before, diabetes, high blood pressure, um, and of course, sickle cell disease, or other risk factors for kidney disease, or you know that your kidney function is not perfectly normal, or you know that although the function itself, that GFR is in the normal range, but you may have protein in the urine, then it is essential to kind of pay attention to a few things that can help you uh, maintaining kidney health. Uh, one of the important determinants of long-term kidney health is blood pressure. If your blood pressure is high, it will damage the kidney. And of course, as mentioned, if your kidney is damaged, it will push your blood pressure higher. So you need to take medications, and there are a few specific medications that probably most patients with kidney disease uh, would benefit from. And those are particularly protective uh, for the kidney. But importantly, your blood pressure should be in the range of 120, 130 over 80, 85. And this should be monitored and measured at home. So it's worthwhile to try to get a blood pressure monitor, a blood pressure cuff, and measure your blood pressure at home with some regularity depending uh, where you are in the trajectory of kidney disease. If you have risk factors for diabetes or if you have diabetes, uh, then you should also monitor your blood sugar and the target range is around six to 10, but it depends. And as, as uh, Dr. Pendrick has pointed out, you need to talk to your healthcare team to figure out what is your target and what is the best for you. Uh, you need to have a uh, regular contact with, uh, with probably multiple healthcare professionals if you have kidney disease, and you need to see them regularly and ask questions about your health and kidney health and, and try to figure out what works for you. Uh, if you need to take medications, please take them as suggested by your care team. If you have side effects, if you, if you don't think that they work for you, uh, please bring it back to your care team and, and try to figure out if, if they can be replaced uh, with something that is better for you. 
Uh, it is important, we will not spend much time on this, but mental health is part of any chronic conditions. It is uh, uh, important for sickle cell disease in general, but it is important for chronic kidney uh, disease or kidney failure. And you need to uh, take a conscious effort to maintain your mental health, especially in stressful situation that we have uh, in, in these days and weeks and years, unfortunately. Uh, make sure that you have uh, close family uh, connections and ties with family friends. You pay attention to your spiritual or religious life uh, if, if that is something that helps you uh, coping with the stress of everyday life. Um, meditation, relaxation, mindfulness will help to manage stress. And that is important in blood pressure management and managing chronic kidney disease. And sleep uh, is quite essential. In addition, uh, healthy eating is also a key to maintain kidney health, heart health, and generally health uh, overall. Uh, you need to watch your portions and uh, tend towards more fruits and vegetables, uh, white meat and fish, as opposed to red meat. And that's, uh, is that is summarized in the Canadian Food Guide. But also, if you have different dietary habits, if, you, if your cultural foods are different, uh, work with a dietitian from your uh, background and figure out what are the healthy foods for you, uh, whether you have kidney disease or not. So these are important aspects. Physical activity uh, is also critical for kidney health and health overall. And it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to be an Olympic athlete, but uh, staying active, doing something physically at least 30 minutes every day uh, or most of the day is quite uh, helpful for all kinds of health aspects. And it could include gardening, having pets and walk out with them, dancing and doing more vigorous activities uh, and sports. So these are critical aspects of managing your health, kidney health and keeping your kidneys stable. Now, if uh, the kidney disease progresses as it does uh, sometimes, um, then uh, you will reach a stage where um, the kidney disease is quite severe. This graph depicts how kidney function generally trends down if you have a kidney damage. Initially, and it could be for years, your kidney function remains in, in the normal range, but gradually it will decline and uh, it reaches pretty low levels, 30, 20, 10% of normal. As I mentioned, kidney disease early on will not have any symptoms. Uh, symptoms such as fatigue, nausea, cramps, itchiness, weight loss, loss of appetite, and other symptoms may appear when your kidney function is as low as 30% of normal. If it goes below that, um, it is uh, uh, getting to the kidney failure range where you may need uh, kidney transplant or dialysis. If it's less than 10, 15% uh, and you have significant symptoms, uh, that may be the next step in your management. In general, for healthy individuals, kidney function declines about 1% a year. And we will see that, uh, that patients who have uh, sickle cell disease, this decline is faster. So what can we do if uh, the kidneys are failing, if the function is 10% or less, if you have symptoms? Uh, uh, it will come to kidney replacement treatment. Uh, and then uh, we will be talking about this. So first I wanted to see if, if you know anyone who has uh, dialysis treatment or receive the kidney transplant, in other words, who had kidney failure and they are receiving kidney replacement therapy. Please uh, answer this question. Um, we have about uh, 20, 30 seconds to answer. I don't see uh, if answers are coming in. So answers, are, answers are coming in, Dr. Muchi. So thus far, we have about uh, four have said yes. Uh, they know someone who's had a who's on dialysis or received a kidney transplant, and three have said no. So about fifty-seven percent. Just giving, yeah. There's a couple more responses are coming in as we speak. I'm going to close the poll in about uh, five seconds, folks.
Okay, share results. So you can see we had uh, five out of eight folks say yes and three out of eight say no. Yeah, so uh, thank you very much for answering the question. So as you see, uh, actually, although we say that well, dialysis or kidney failure is not that frequent, but pretty much uh, many people from the audience, and then this is true for, for other groups as well, know someone at least who, who may be treated with dialysis or transplant. So what, what are these treatments? Um, both treatment types, both transplant and dialysis are fairly complex and complicated, and they do require quite a bit of commitment. Uh, this, these pictures depict the two different, two main types of dialysis. There is hemodialysis, uh, which uh, kind of is indicated on this, uh, this side of the, the slide, and peritoneal dialysis, um, uh, on the on my left. So uh, peritoneal dialysis is done for about one in three patients who are on dialysis. If you do this type of treatment, you have a plastic tube running deep inside your belly and you use uh, specific uh, special solutions to fill your stomach with the flu fluid, let it sit there for a few hours and then drain it out four or five times a day, or sometimes this is done with a machine uh, that does it for you overnight, uh, again, changes this fluid uh, every couple of hours. And with this, doing this, it, it replaces some of the kidney function, it cleans the blood uh, and removes some of the toxins that we spoke about earlier. Hemodialysis is, and importantly, this type of treatment, the peritoneal dialysis is done at home. There, there is a general sense that it may be a bit more gentle dialysis than hemodialysis. It is done every day though, and it takes quite a bit of time uh, to do this. If you have to do hemodialysis, uh, then you would usually go to the hospital uh, or a dialysis unit. Uh, you can do it at home. Again, it does require some additional kind of changes in the home. In the hospital, you have this big machine that, uh, and then nurses would put needles or you may have a line here in your neck and the machine would be hooked to that line. Uh, the line ends in, in your uh, large vein and, and basically that draws blood out from your circulation into the machine. The machine runs that blood through a specific filter uh, which cleans your blood and, and does at least some of the job that the kidneys do. And, and dialysis, as I said, usually done in these somewhat large dialysis units, um, either satellite units or units at the hospital. Uh, if you do hemodialysis, you do this at least usually three times a, a week, three to four, sometimes longer hours. If you do it at home, sometimes you can do it at night, six to eight hours every other day or, or four or five days a week to get more dialysis uh, than, uh, than this uh, uh, intermittent type would give you. Transplant is quite different. When you have a kidney transplant, it means that um, you have an additional kidney, you receive a kidney from someone, either a living or a deceased person, um, it is a surgical procedure and that, that third kidney, the kidney transplant graft is put into your, in, in your belly, in front of your belly uh, and your own kidneys will stay there. These are indicated up here and as, as kind of diseased or scarred kidneys. Why do we need this complex treatment? Uh, transplant is also done for liver or heart and lung and pancreas. And so if those organs fail, uh, we don't have machines uh, for most of them uh, that would replace the kidney function as dialysis would for, for kidney failure. So uh, transplant really is the only treatment for many of the organ failures. And it's probably the best treatment for kidney failure for most patients. Um, uh, so that is why a surgical procedure is needed to, to get a, a healthy functioning organ uh, to replace the function of a failing one if you have that, uh, that condition that leads to the failure. Now, uh, I wonder if uh, the audience knows a little bit about uh, the two different kidney replacement therapies. Uh, the question is that, um, is it true that uh, on average, a kidney transplant provides at least five years longer life compared to dialysis or the treatments are mainly the same in terms of longevity of the patients. So 
So answers are rolling in. We're just gonna give folks a few more seconds. Right now the resounding response is yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, that sounds right. And that is why I said that that transplant is uh, the best, even if we have alternatives like dialysis, transplant uh, usually provides longer life. That may not be true for everybody. Uh, if you're older, older than 65 or 70, uh, you may not get much longer life from uh, uh, transplant. So uh, yeah, so on average though, it is true that uh, that transplant gives you longer life. So I said that if, if you're older, you may not live longer, but why would we do a transplant for older people or do we do or should we do a transplant for older people? Uh, the next question maybe explores that. Um, in this question, we want to know what you think about how uh, transplant and dialysis compares when it comes to uh, quality of life of the patient. Um, is transplant much better compared to dialysis? Is transplant a little better? or are more or less the same, or it is uh, the other way around that dialysis is better and transplant would be worse. That's the fourth answer, a little or much worse, maybe because of the surgery or the medications that you need to take. How does the transplant and dialysis affect quality of life? So about 30% of our attendees have responded, just waiting for that number to get a little bit higher before I share the results. giving folks about another 20 seconds or so to respond. Okay, closing the poll now. Okay, so it seems that everybody knows that transplant is uh, associated with better quality of life. And for most patients, it's actually quite significantly better. It, you're free from dialysis and there are a number of other advantages. You feel stronger, you can eat and drink what you want, which is restricted when you're on dialysis. So it is quite important, um, uh, the difference, and it, it is usually much better quality of life. So moving on, uh, I will ask Pearl uh, to come on scene and, and uh, present about uh, the impact of kidney uh, sickle cell disease on kidneys uh, in children. Um, good morning, everyone. M my name is Dr. Pearl, and I am an intern at uh, in a hospital here in Tanzania called Bugando Medical Hospital. And I'm going to present about sickle cell disease in children with relation to the kidney. So, first of all, uh, sickle cell. What it what, 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 what is it? It's a group of genetic disorders that lead to chronic hemolytic anemia, which is like the breakdown of red blood cells inside the vessels, which causes damage to many organs. Um, the, genetic, the, the genetic disorder is like a substitution of an amino acid at, the, at, at a specific position in the beta globin chain. So when red blood cells sickle, it leads to obstruction of the blood flow, which, lead, which leads to tissues not getting enough oxygen. This leads to tissue damage and uh, organ damage and leading, and this leads to pain, which is, which, which is what we call the vasoclusive crises. The sickle cells can also permanently damage uh, specific organs. We have the brain, we have the kidneys, which is what, I, which is what we'll be talking about today. This leads to chronic pain in, in people with sickle cell disease. Um, sickle cell disease in children. So globally, 300,000 children are born with sickle cell disease every year, with 80% of the affected children in Africa. In the US, it's uh, approximately like 2,600 babies are born with sickle cell every year. In Canada, this number is is likely less than 300 per year. In Tanzania here where I am, it has the highest yearly births of uh, sickle cell disease infants, especially around the 
the the Great Lakes area, like Lake Victoria, Mwanza, where I am right now, is one of the highest, it has the highest births of children with sickle cell. It's estimated around 11,000 births a year. So without intervention, around 50 to 90% of the children will die because of the healthcare system is, isn't very isn't very developed and also the economic status of the of the parents and the children born into these families these are all they all contribute to the to the to the mortality of the children so the there's a 5 to 10 year survival for children with sickle cell disease in the united and in the in the united kingdom that's more than 95% so you can compare to the percentages shown in in, in, in Tanzania. Um, sickle cell disease in children in Tanzania. So here in my hospital, the, we admit first of all in the, in the emergency department. So around three to four children daily are admitted with sickle cell anemia over so occlusive crises. And all the admitted children like we, after we admit the children, we, we tell the parents, after, after treating them, we tell them to attend a sickle cell clinic. So approximately around 1,000 children a year are, are attended to in this, in the dedicated sickle cell clinic. The routine care that we give to the, to the children is malaria prophylaxis. We put them on anti-malarials because this, we're in the area Mwanza, especially, Mwanza, Uganda, Kenya, all this were, were an endemic area for malaria. And uh, we give them folic acid daily. We, we also give them penicillin V for infections for children less than five, five years old. And um, we, we also advise them to, the moment a child is diagnosed with sickle cell, we advise them if they can afford it to, to pay for insurance because this is a lifelong disease. But unfortunately, because of the economic status, this can be a, a challenge. Only a small proportion of the children receive hydroxyria, but according to the guidelines in East Africa, like for example, here in Tanzania, it recommends that we initiate hydroxyria in children who have frequent crises but they have, but mostly those who are more than five years old. Most of the admitted children who, who we admit here in the hospital, they suffer with undernutrition, either they're, they're not receiving the proper diet or because of the constant illnesses that they're suffering from and the economic statuses, they, they, are, they are also malnourished in addition to it. So also they suffer from se severe anemia and other acute infections like sepsis, malaria, and UTIs, urinary tract infections. Uh, vaso occlusive pain crises are the most common complication of children with sickle cell anemia, especially if it's cold here. We even get more than the three to four admissions. So when it's really cold, especially at night, we, we, have, we have more admissions here. And uh, they, when they're admitted, they usually suffer with the pain for around three days on average. And we, we usually treat them with anti-pain medications like paracetamol, ibuprofen, morphine, tramadol, but we have to be wary because of their constant crises, the pain crises. We try to avoid using tramadol and morphine, but Sometimes they're in so much pain, we, we just give them this medication. So some of the solutions to the challenges that we have with, with the sickle cell suffering children is like we, during the clinic visits, we should educate the, we try to educate the patients on infection prevention of mal like malaria, prophylaxis, uh, prevention of dehydration, and we try to counsel them on proper pain medication at home because some of the children, we, there's a child who we admitted who had been a sickler 
from when she was a child. So like this year, she was around 17 years old, but she knew, she knows her proper treatment plan and she knew that paracetamol doesn't work for her. So she, she, was, she, she was asking for tramadol. So at that point we were very worried and we were like, maybe she's addicted to tramadol. So we tried to counsel the, the, the parents of the children on the proper pain medication at home to avoid the overuse of kidney toxic medications. We encourage also routine screening for acute, acute kidney injury or, or chronic kidney disease in sickle cell disease children. The kidney abnormalities or the kidney problems in children with sickle cell disease in general. So as early as infancy, especially it's been said, so around four years old, the, the children start showing some, some clinical manifestations in their kidney. So the first manifestation as a parent that you can say is like, they have excessive and nighttime urine, urination. This can lead to the dehydration problem that I mentioned earlier. Also proteinuria, which is like, since your kidney normally saves and retains uh, important proteins, these can be lost in the urine when, when you have sickle cell disease. Also hematuria, it's like the bloody urine, like you have urine in your blood. However, some other complications of sickle cell disease like urinary tract infections can also cause this, this kidney abnormality. Um, because one of, the risk, one of the risk factors for acute kidney injury is vaso-occlusive crises. And as a, as a child who has sickle cell disease, they have these these crisis is repeatedly, recurrently. So this is affecting the, the kidney. They get the acute kidney injury also repeatedly. These repeated, uh, these repeated injuries to the kidneys can also lead to, can also lead to uh, chronic kidney disease. Also, we also have the, because of the pain, they're also getting the anti-pain medication like ibuprofen and also the infections they get, we usually treat them with aminoglycosides, which are also toxic to the kidneys. So they get the acute kidney injuries. And uh, chronic, kidney, chronic kidney disease is also something that they suffer from. So this can manifest, especially in the late adolescence, or they can suffer from kid, kidney failure in early, early adulthood. monitoring how can we monitor and manage this specific problem how can especially with a focus on the kidney we can uh, connect to specialty clinics for example i think it's best like if you have a child who has sickle cell disease you should you should connect them to to the nephrologist it should be a a, a, a symbiotic relationship with the pediatrician and the nephrologist so patient organization for support. We should, we should also start monitoring for protein in the urine after six to 10 years of age. Therefore, if we monitor this, then we can, we can, we can delay the progress to chronic kidney disease. Um, hydroxyurea is, can be used to reduce kidney damage from sickle cell disease. If, if there is proteinuria, it's best to start angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors or receptor blockers. These are protein protective, especially with if you're having like proteinuria. We should use like non-medical approaches like a change in diet and exercise with moderation. These are all beneficial to, to sickle cell disease like children. Maintain hydration because this is a problem I mentioned earlier that they, that they suffer from. If you should seek medical help once you see early signs of vasoclusive crisis, use medication like the, the ones you use for anti-pain for, for the pain that they're experiencing during the vasoclusive crisis is like ibuprofen, Voltron, judiciously and carefully. And if the kidney function is impaired, you should avoid them if possible. Thank you very much.
Thank you very much, Pearl. So we continue uh, into, into adulthood. And basically, uh, you know, the next few slides summarize how kidneys are affected from uh, sickle cell disease. And this is pretty much similar to what Pearl already listed for, for children. Uh, we know that about one in three of the uh, children uh, and young adults have at least some degree of kidney damage from the sickle cell disease. Uh, and as I mentioned, this may be asymptomatic and subtle, but about one in five um, adults will develop kidney failure, and then they will need some kind of treatment, kidney replacement treatment for that, which may be an issue if you're in Africa, because dialysis or transplant may not be as readily available as it is here in, in Canada. But even uh, in Canada or in the US, uh, patients may not be able to get uh, appropriate care. So just uh, this, this, tape, this figure so, so, or the slide summarizes the different types of uh, kidney injuries. Um, the first more subtle signs are the, the ones that uh, Pearl mentioned, that the kidney is not able to regulate the water and acid and potassium excretion, but protein may be present in the urine. And initially the kidneys try to overwork and actually the function, uh, the measured kidney function uh, from the blood work may uh, indicate higher than normal kidney function, better than normal kidney function, which is actually a trouble because eventually the kidney will suffer from that and the kidney function will decline and will decline more rapidly. Loss of kidney function is, as opposed to the 1% that I mentioned for healthy individuals, could be 2 to 3% every year after young, young adulthood uh, in patients with sickle cell disease. And as I mentioned, uh, using the current measures, especially uh, when, when this uh, race-based adjustment was used, uh, frequently is, is very inaccurate and overestimates the kidney function, which means that it underestimates the existing damage. Um, over the last few months, actually, that race-based equation and any uh, indication for that is being removed from the labs in, uh, in Ontario. And this just shows you the, the, this decline of kidney function. This was a study uh, recently published. It included about 10,000 individuals. Uh, many of them were healthy African-Americans, and there were more than 1,000 patients who had sickle cell trait and uh, more than 200 who had sickle cell disease. And uh, the two graphs uh, depict the decline of kidney function in different ways, but basically the red line uh, indicates people who had sickle cell disease. And as you see, the decline in kidney function is the fastest for them. Uh, the, the solid black line is the, the healthy uh, non-sickle cell disease patients. And this gray line indicates uh, patients with sickle cell trait. And you see that the decline in kidney function, even for those patients is somewhat higher, somewhat more rapid than uh, people without uh, sickle cell uh, trait or disease. So if you have sickle cell uh, disease or trait, you need to monitor your kidney function. You need to ask your healthcare team to pay attention. Of course, uh, not everybody declines equally fast. There's a number of factors uh, that, uh, that can impact that. Some of them are genetic and you may not be able to do much about it, but uh, both treatment can slow down the progression and certain lifestyle factors that we mentioned before, diet, uh, exercise, smoking and maintaining weight uh, are important to manage kidney uh, disease. The medical treatments include the hydroxyurea that were mentioned already, um, Red cell transfusions uh, are, are used to maintain hemoglobin and uh, reduce the impact of the crisis. Uh, they may or may not have too much effect on the kidney function itself. Um, the, the specific blood pressure medications that were mentioned, the angiotensin and converting enzymes inhibitors or receptor blockers, they are specific kidney protective uh, medications and people who have uh, protein in the urine or high blood pressure uh, should take these medications. Uh, even if your blood pressure is normal, sometimes we try to see if you can tolerate these medications to reduce the protein. There are other experimental treatments. And I also would like to point out the concerns about pain medication. On the one hand, pain needs to be treated, uh, need, needs to be treated aggressively and very efficiently, uh, but, uh, we have to be careful because some of the pain medications may have a uh, negative effect on the kidney and specifically non-steroid anti-inflammatory medications uh, are kidney toxic. So that has to be considered. 
if you have kidney failure, uh, both dialysis and transplant uh, should be considered for most of the patients. Uh, peritoneal dialysis might be uh, preferable compared to hemodialysis. And kidney transplant, as mentioned, uh, provides longer life and better quality of life. Uh, we know that uh, that is true for patients with sickle cell disease as well. So if you're eligible for a kidney transplant, you should consider that. Uh, and we know that at least uh, in the states where there have been research about this, uh, patients who have sickle cell disease, they are less likely to get on the waiting list or get a transplant. The reasons are not quite well understood. Uh, importantly, for patients after transplant, exchange transfusions uh, may still be beneficial and may be needed to maintain good health and kidney health and reduce the frequency of crisis. Uh, we spoke about the sickle cell trait. Um, the impact on kidney function is much less than uh, that of sickle cell disease. It's a, a, a smaller risk. In fact, actually, people who have sickle cell trait may be a candidate for kidney donation. So they can potentially donate a kidney while they're alive. Uh, that has to be carefully assessed in the in the in the uh, living donor office, uh, and the care team will need to pay careful attention to that. Importantly, if uh, sickle cell trait co-occurs with diabetes or high blood pressure, of course, that then uh, the risks from those conditions will add up. Towards the end of this discussion, uh, I would like to go back to, to transplant. And this uh, figure just uh, kind of points to the Trillium Gift of Life Network. Uh, they, their website, which uh, is listed here, has a lot of useful information about kidney transplant and organ transplant and donation. And uh, as mentioned, I'm from the UHN Ajmeri Transplant Program um, and just wanted to kind of uh, brag a little bit. Uh, our transplant center is one of the largest in North America, not necessarily the kidney, but uh, overall, including liver, lung, and heart transplant. Uh, uh, we trans uh, transplant more than 600 uh, uh, patients a year. Uh, these years here are for the COVID years, and unfortunately, uh, COVID impacted our transplant activity in 2020. Uh, we only did around 160 kidney transplant, uh, although it's coming back to around 200, 220 um, last year, and hopefully we will be able to do as many uh, this year as well. In Ontario, about 700 transplants, kidney transplants are done every year. There are about 8,000 patients who are on dialysis and only around 1,100 are on the waiting list. So getting on the waiting list uh, is quite important because as we discussed, transplant is a better treatment. Now, when it comes to transplant and organ transplant, there are two major types that is important to know about. One is uh, living donor transplant and the other is deceased donor transplant. Uh, living donor transplant, importantly, uh, the patient needs to find a donor. While for deceased donor transplant, Trillium Gift of Life organizes, the healthcare system organizes the donor. If you want a living donor transplant, you need to be able to find your own donor, um, which is not an easy task, and you should try to get help uh, if you need that. Uh, why is it important? Um, and of course, it's important to know that it's only available for, only possible for liver and kidney transplant, uh, for heart, lung, um, pancreas, it's only disease donor transplant. And the majority of liver and, and kidney transplants are still done from disease donors. Um, but living donor transplant has a number of advantages. It lasts longer. Uh, the waiting time is much shorter. Uh, a waiting time for a uh, disease or a transplant could be up to six, eight years after you start dialysis, which is an awful lot of time. Uh, and the results are good from a disease or a transplant as well, but uh, not as good as with living donor transplant. When we talk about disease donor transplantation, it's important to emphasize that registering and as, organ, as an organ donor after your death is important. Um, transplantation can save lives. And in fact, one donor can save eight lives because uh, the two halves of your lung can go to two different people, heart, liver, uh, and two kidneys can go to uh, various patients. And uh, the, the health impact on those patients is quite uh, impressive and uh, significant. Um, 
If you want to consider registering, uh, you can do that online or when you renew your health card or driver's license. It's important to know that whether you register or not, um, uh, the doctors in the hospital uh, will ask the family uh, whether they agree to donation. Um, the family is in a better situation if they know that the person registered, because then they know their wishes. If they don't, in that difficult time, they may not want to sign up for transplant. So that's why it's important to register, but also it's important to let the family know um, that uh, this is what one wants. Uh, many people fear that if they register as a donor, then the healthcare system will not try everything to save them because they want them as a donor and not to save their life. It's important to know in that regard that uh, the doctors who treat you in the ICU, they wouldn't know uh, uh, whether you're registered or not. Uh, they do whatever they can, and only if the person is dying would they notify the donor team, and then the donor workup would start. And of course, uh, paying or, or buying or selling organs for transplant is illegal. But as I mentioned, living donor transplantation may be a, a better way to approach uh, kidney transplant at least, and maybe liver transplantation uh, because of the advantages that uh, you see here. Uh, but of course, that means that you give up one kidney. Uh, we said that you have two. Now the question is, and this is our last poll, can you live a healthy life with one kidney only? Yes or no? Responses are coming in. I'll be giving folks another 45 seconds to respond. So again, the question is, can you live a completely healthy life with one kidney as long as with two? Yes or no? Ten more seconds. Okay, sharing results. Okay, yeah, that's true. That's absolutely true. Uh, although obviously any procedure uh, has some risks and kidney transplantation has some risks as well, or kidney donation. Uh, but uh, with one kidney, you can uh, live just as a healthy life as with two. Uh, the risks that are associated with donation are much less than, for example, driving on the 401. So we wouldn't hesitate to ask someone to drive us down to the hospital, uh, but it's actually more risky for them than to donate a kidney for us. Uh, living donor uh, transplants last on average five to 10 years longer than deceased donor transplants. On average, uh, a living, a deceased donor transplant may last around eight to 14 years, depending. And living donor transplants can last around 16 to 20 years, or on average 18 years or so. And the last part of this uh, talk will be about diversity and how uh, patients from different uh, uh, racialized uh, or ethnic communities uh, fare or can access healthcare. Uh, you know that Canada is one of the most diverse uh, countries. Immigration is uh, very significant in this country. And as early as 2011, more than 20% of the population of Canada were born outside. And when we say outside, uh, of course, that includes the whole world. There is a very significant uh, immigration from the Caribbean, uh, from South America, and from Africa as well, as well as South and East Asia. Currently, uh, about one third of uh, the population in Ontario uh, were born outside of uh, Canada, and the largest uh, communities, uh, uh, racialized communities, are South Asians, uh, East or Asians, or Chinese, or the African, Caribbean, and Black communities. Now, importantly, pretty much all of uh, the, uh, the racialized communities, East Asians and South Asians, and uh, ACB patients have a higher risk to have kidney failure compared to white or European individuals. And the risk is the highest for people coming from Latin America or the Caribbeans. 
or Sub-Saharan Africa, and the risk is more than twofold for, for those uh, communities. So that's uh, one side of the coin. A risk of kidney failure is higher, and we know uh, from our research and others that uh, patients from these communities have 50 to 70% less chance to get a living neurotransplant, and that impacts transplant overall. So access to the best treatment of kidney failure is much less uh, available for patients from racialized communities. When we think about that frequently, uh, knowledge about these conditions uh, will come into the discussion. And we actually measured uh, transplant-related knowledge in about almost 600 patients on dialysis. Um, and pretty much actually about half of them didn't really know the answers for the various questions. We asked about 18 questions. and. Uh, for many of these questions, more than 50% uh, didn't know the proper answer. Now, when we look at uh, the racialized groups, uh, clearly it seems that uh, both uh, patients from ACB communities, East, East Asian and South Asian patients had uh, more chance to uh, be in the lowest third of the, the score and less, less chance to score high compared to white patients. So it seems that transplant-related knowledge is less in the racialized communities. But more importantly, uh, patients from these communities, they're not really willing to talk about their condition with others. And as I mentioned, if you have kidney failure and want a living donor transplant, you need to find your donor yourself, or your family will need to find your donor. And if you're not willing or not able to talk to because you, you fear judgment, you're, you're very private about health issues, as, as many of the individuals from these communities are, then uh, that's an impossible task to find a living donor. So based on the, these inequities, uh, and we are still doing research on this, but we also try to plan next steps. Uh, we are providing or trying to develop this uh, kidney health education and treatment resource hub um, that uh, Arjuna will be talking about in a minute. And we will need to have your input. Uh, we have a, a patient group working with the Center of Living Organ Donation. It's an African Caribbean Black Organ Health YouTube channel team. These are patients, kidney and living uh, transplant recipient, liver transplant recipients and donors. Uh, who built this YouTube channel, I suggest you check it out. There is a very uh, interesting content uh, on it. It's being uh, continuously improved and expanded. And we also want to, uh, to build uh, information for these communities um, together with the communities. And we hope to build kidney clinics for African Caribbean and black patients. Uh, we are planning one with the Taibu Community Health Centers in Scarborough and, and one uh, at UHN that would be specifically designed uh, with, with uh, African Caribbean and black patients in mind. And I will pass it on to Algina to talk about uh, this resource hub, uh, which is currently being planned. And we very much look forward to hearing from you uh, what would you need uh, from, from uh, us to put on that website and in what way, Arjuna? Sorry, thank you, Dr. Moji, and um, a huge thank you to the Sickle Cell Awareness Group of Ontario for having us here today. So yes, um, I'll be presenting our proposal to essentially co-develop a resource hub about kidney health, kidney disease, kidney failure, and treatment options. Um, so today we'll be talking a little bit about the background. We'll go over our main goal, which is tr building trust and cultural safety. Um, I'll be presenting you our plan and timeline, and the majority of the talk will be be um, in collecting feedback. Perfect. So as Dr. Mucci has mentioned, um, so as of 2016, visible minorities comprise of almost 30% um, of Ontario's population. So more and more Canadian regions are being populated by communities other than white Europeans and white North Americans. Yet, as we know, um, the everyday experiences and perceptions of Indigenous and racialized peoples in Canada differ significantly from those of non-visible minorities and white individuals in many ways. Um, so for example, as we know, Indigenous peoples don't have equitable access to health services compared to, compared to the general Canadian population due to geography, health system deficiencies, and inadequate health human resources. 
Now, um, and again, as we know, although there's some conditions that are inherited at greater rates in some ethnic groups, such as sickle cell disease, the majority of chronic illnesses have many contributing factors like social determinants of health, like access to healthcare, support networks, education, stress, um, and a, an ongoing stressor is anti-Black racism, which we believe is a major contributing factor to many disparate health disparities that Black people experience. So um, to my set, to our second point, as Dr. Mucci has mentioned, um, we have found that compared to white patients, both South and East Asian and Black patients are much less likely, at least 50% less likely than white patients to obtain a living donor kidney transplants. So we have, we're seeing that these patients from racialized communities have much less use or access to living donor transplants, which as we know, we think is the best medical treatment for kidney failure um, as they last longer, have fewer complications with surgery and shorter waiting times. So as part of one of our projects, we conducted focus groups with self-identified members of um, African, Caribbean, and Black communities, patients. So this included a huge uh, variety of individuals, patients, caregivers, um, general community health members, and healthcare professionals. And our aim is to reduce inequities and in access to living donor kidney transplants in these communities. So um, we had a qualitative arm. So we actually talked to people and actually listened to what they say. And um, I, as Dr. Mucci mentioned, part of this work was us working with a patient group um, and on YouTube and professional advisors. So um, again, a, a seminal finding was that many of our questions about um, transplant knowledge between 50 to 80% of respondents said that they don't know um, the answer. And most of these were actively engaged in transplant work already. So to the fourth point, um, so that another seminal finding was that um, what we heard from patients in the community is that this is because of racism and discrimination that they face in this healthcare system, there's a lack of trust in the system. So, you know, healthcare providers may be suggesting things um, and, but with good intentions, but the um, individuals on the other end may not hear it that way. So, and another layer to this is that about 50 to 70% of racialized groups are recent immigrants. So they're bringing in these health belief systems from their countries of origin, which may be different from the Western perspective. Um, and so when they present this in hospital settings, they're sometimes ridiculed, you know, um, not, and they are left feeling as though they're not um, regarded as equals. So, and coming in with these unacknowledged experiences and beliefs. So that brings us to our project, which is to co-develop a resource hub, hub about kidney health, kidney disease, kidney failure and treatment options. Um, and again, the emphasis is that it's trusted, appropriate, and relevant to African, Caribbean, and Black individuals. Um, and these are our key values, which is number first and foremost, getting community input and perspectives um, and co-developing this. Secondly, of course, to build equity, diversity, inclusion, and, and finally, approach, having a holistic approach to health. So this value where we want to build trust and culture safety, um, you know, we want to one example of this is that we're working with a community organization the acb organ health youtube channel committee so it's a team of patients and educators who co-create trusted video content and resources specifically for um, individuals of african caribbean and black ancestry um, and so the way we would approach this on our, on our website of course experts will explicitly share this commitment you know with statements but at every piece of knowledge that we share, our goal is to um, cater it to this community. Yeah. And as for our outline, so here's a list of headings that we have. So um, picture this as like different tabs on the website. Um, so we start with a mission statement, some information about kidney function, knowing treatment options, a barrier section, how to support people that get that are how to support someone getting into a kidney transplant, life after transplantation, and a healthcare provider section. Um, specifically, so um, so first and foremost, of course, we want to provide general information about kidney function, causes of kidney disease, um, particularly diet and lifestyle, because of course those are very modifiable factors and especially important. Um, and so again, while this information is general and of course available elsewhere, our goal is to provide information that is most relevant and easily accessible. Um, and then the treatment options slide um, set tab where we want to basically explain what is dialysis, what is kidney transplant to better inform individuals that are visiting this website. 
Um, and then finally, uh, uh, two other sections, one for life after transplantation. So, you know, there's many great things that come after transplant, like having better health and more freedom to do things you enjoy. But um, of course, we want to inform individuals of all um, outcomes. And finally, a section on how to support someone with a kidney transplant. So, you know, prevention. So this includes information about prevention, how to cope or live with kidney disease, how to support someone that is living with kidney disease, and as well as information on finding life donors. And finally, a section on for healthcare providers so they can provide more culturally sensitive um, information when speaking to their patients. And for this one, we will definitely be collaborating with um, ACB patients and families to help create these videos um, to better inform healthcare providers. And as for the stylistics and layout, um, we'll be, you know, these are this is a huge list of websites that we're referring to that kind of emphasize cultural safety in healthcare. And um, so things that we've garnered from our research is that we want to lots of representative imaging and language, showing um, people of color, showing partners um, and using inclusive language. And finally, I want to turn the discussion to you. Um, well, so these are a few discussion points that we can touch on and before we open up the floor to general Q&A. Um, so I will let you read these. Um, and if you can just um, leave your comments in the chat or Q&A. Thank you very much, Anjina. Uh, so that's the end of our uh, a discussion or presentation. This is uh, just uh, acknowledging our, our funders, uh, our, our equity project in, in uh, uh, kidney health and racialized communities is supported by the Kidney Foundation, by Health Canada, and we have additional support from the Canadian Donation and Transplantation uh, Research Program. And this, this uh, set of photos represent uh, members of our group. Um, so going back to this list, and I leave this on, maybe for some time you can read, and, and I, we would appreciate any questions you have about uh, the, the kidney health section or about the website or this resource hub, and whatever suggestions you may have now, or you can also contact us uh, later. Uh, my email address is on, on the first slide, um, and that will be available to you if, you if you want to contact us. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you for Pearl and Algina for the presentation. And thank you very much for Scargo to invite us. And we hope that this was the first in a series of engagements and discussions, and we, we count on your help to build this website. Thank you very much. Okay, well, thank you very much, um, uh, Isvan, Pearl, and, uh, and Arjina. Um, we did have some questions coming in to the Q&A section during the talk, and maybe we can go through those first and then open it up to uh, any kind of new questions that might have come up. Um, so the first question has to do with the issue about diet. And the question is, is there any sort of organization that could help connect patients with a dietitian who can appreciate the different cultural backgrounds that patients come from so that they can work collaboratively to come up with an appropriate diet based on, um, I, I guess, the, uh, the, the cuisine of their, of their ethnic uh, background? Yeah, thank you very much for the question. I think it is quite important. Uh, uh, and yes, I think it, it reflects our increasing awareness as well uh, of, of uh, both the importance of diet, but also the importance of paying attention to differences. Because there's, uh, we have been operating, I think, for a long time, and probably much of the healthcare system still operates on this kind of one size fits all. So we know what is healthy. We tell you what to do, what to eat and how to uh, behave. And uh, and you, your only job is to, to listen to us and do what we tell you to do, which is probably not something that will work. And, and the difference, you can have a healthy diet in many different ways. You need to figure out what works for you. And there is increasingly, um, available services. I know that, that for example, the Taibu Community Health Center have uh, specific dietary uh, advice for patients with diabetes and weight issues and cardiovascular disease. Um, uh, Black Health Alliance, uh, one of our partners as well in, in the research work, they also have uh, a couple of uh, dietitians uh, from uh, the Black communities who, who work with them and, and then they can advise uh, individuals. We hope to, to build that resource into our website as well. 
And there, there are similarly um, other uh, communities. There is a, a very strong uh, South Asian Diabetes and Dietary uh, uh, Association for patient support uh, to, to uh, advise people from that culture background to, to figure out what the be better diet is. So uh, Taibu and Black Health, Black Health Alliance could be one direction, um, but uh, hopefully soon our, our resource hub will, will be able to connect you with additional resources. Okay, that's great. So, so like a lot of the, the patient advocacy groups um, will often have dietitians like that they'll that they can refer you to. Yeah, and sorry, just just uh, coming back to the ACB YouTube channel. Uh, this is uh, this this uh, group of uh, patients and donors and advocates also uh, have links uh, within the community, and I think uh, diet is part of of uh, post transplant life as well. Uh, although we say that you're much more free to eat whatever you like, still a healthy uh, diet is quite an important part of, of post-transplant life and patients uh, in that group uh, uh, will have additional resources. So the ACB YouTube channel as well. If you want to connect with them, their YouTube channel site uh, was on, the, on one of the slides. And again, if you email me, I can connect you with the, with the team as well. That's great. Okay, next question. This might be uh, better directed towards Dr. Misende. Uh, the question is, my understanding is that sickle cell disease provides some protection against malaria, and I would think that this would be even more so when circulating hemoglobin S is higher uh, during a crisis. So can you help me understand the use of malaria prophylaxis for children with sickle cell disease? I guess the idea being that wouldn't the sickle cell disease, particularly when you're admitted with a crisis, be protective against uh, having malaria? So from my understanding, it's it's said that it's a hemo, it's a sickle cell trait that is more protective. But if you have the sickle cell disease, it isn't it isn't as protective. So what I've seen is the children who fully have the uh, sickle cell disease, when they when they get the when they come to the hospital and they if they have malaria in addition to the crisis, they suffer more. It's not the it's not the sickle cell disease that is protective. It's the trait that is protective. Very good, thank you. Okay, another question. Um, this is uh, about the the use of different pain medications, and uh, so the question is. It's, it's first. It's a comment saying that there's a lot of stigma about using narcotics. Um, and, uh, and so many sickle patients will like try to avoid using morphine and therefore might be more likely to push use of, of non-steroidal anti-inflammatories like Voltaren. Um, but is that ultimately going to hurt the kidney more if we, if we sort of try to push NSAIDs instead of, instead of narcotics? I think, uh... Yeah, so potentially the non-steroidals are more harmful to, for the kidney as the narcotics. Um, they may or may not work as efficiently in an acute crisis. So uh, you, you will need probably uh, narcotics in an acute crisis anyways. And I think uh, both the acute crisis and uh, the chronic management of, of ongoing pain uh, with sickle cell is best done in the context of a multidisciplinary pain management clinic where both medical and non-medical um, aspects uh, can be explored. And uh, obviously that is uh, beyond uh, my experience and expertise, but people are using different ways including some of the resources or ways that I mentioned, meditation, relaxation, and, and gentle physical activity, massage, and other non-medical non approaches will be probably helpful to alleviate some of the pain. Obviously, that wouldn't work in crisis, and this is clearly an issue that, that many patients will not go to the emergency or will go them there late because they, they have experiences that they were labeled as drug seekers, whereas um, the pain that they experience is excruciating. And so uh, I think the key is that pain needs to be managed, uh, whatever it takes. 
it's better managed in a professional setting because uh, if you're well hydrated, if they give you, if you if you're in a crisis, they will give you intravenous fluids as well, which then protect somewhat from the kidney toxic effect of the non-steroidals. And if they need to use that in combination with narcotics to achieve the maximum effect to alleviate, alleviate the pain as quickly and as profoundly as possible, then you go on and and uh, leave. I think the chronic regular use of non-steroidals is the real real threat to to uh, the kidneys, and certainly the kidneys in sickle cell disease are quite sensitive for non-steroidal impact. And especially if you have some degree of kidney impairment already, and that's also why it's important for you to know to go to your uh, healthcare team. If you have some degree of kidney impairment, the use of these uh, drugs will be increasingly risky. If I could take the liberty as, uh, as the moderator here to follow up on that. You know, we, we are given pretty concrete advice about the use of IV Volterra or Toradol um, in that, you know, while patients are admitted, we shouldn't be giving them more than five days of therapy for example, due to considerations of, of nephrotoxicity. But there's not as, at least I'm not aware of any kind of similar clear guidance about maximum daily dose or duration of therapy with weaker NSAIDs like ibuprofen. Uh, so what do you, what kind of recommendations would, could you give us in terms of like telling patients, you know, how much is too much when they're taking Advil? Yeah, so uh, again, I think uh, it, it will depend on the specific context. Uh, regular daily use of ibuprofen, although the, the potency and the toxicity is different between the different medications, but regular daily or regular kind of more than once a week use is potentially nephrotoxic on the long term. It's not one or two days, one or two courses of these treatments, if you need it, will not harm the kidney immediately. While you're taking it, you need to make sure to make sure that you're well hydrated. And again, if you have a pain crisis, if you have fever, and that's that's a point about malaria as well. That's why it needs to be prevented. If you have fever, you're higher uh, at a higher risk of of getting toxicity from these medications. Um, if you need that regular use, I suggest to connect with a multidisciplinary pain clinic and explore other uh, sources. Um, I'm again, I'm not uh, an expert in pain medication. Uh, we have at UHN a multidisciplinary pain clinic. Uh, I think uh, the hematology groups that mm. manage patients with sickle cell, they have a, a better experience or expertise with pain management. Uh, in the acute setting, in the acute crisis, I think anything that helps alleviate the pain quickly is Im important to use and utilize. Um, and also because then you, you are able to monitor the response and monitor the kidney function and adjust the hydration. So I think in an acute setting, that's not an issue. In the, at home, if you take the Voltaren or the ibuprofen every day, that is something that you need to avoid. If, if you need to do that for more than three, four days, I suggest to connect with your healthcare team. Okay, that's good advice. Okay, another question. Um... So there, there's this, the, the comment is that there's concern that if we start trying to emphasize the risk of kidney damage and kidney function as part of your pain management strategy for sickle cell patients, that this will result in more health inequities. Um, uh, presumably, I think what they mean is uh, there, that there will be under treatment of pain because of concern about uh, nephrotoxicity. So the question is, how do we share this message about um, you know, treating pain appropriately while not injuring the kidney effectively with healthcare providers who maybe don't know as much about sickle cell disease and are, are you know, less confident in managing it? Like how do, we, how do we get this message out in a way that does not inadvertently result in under-treatment of pain? Yes, I think it, it, is, it is a very good uh, and important comment then because we need to uh, pay attention and of course, I, I'm a nephrologist, so I, I am biased. I'm my I have a tunnel vision and I see those two kidneys and I want to protect them no matter what. But th there is a person around that kidney and uh, the person, the whole person needs to be uh, treated and managed. And so obviously living with pain, living with excruciating pain is, is not feasible. So pain needs to be managed. Um, I think 
efforts like our website, which will have a, a professional facing uh, uh, side uh, and information about appropriate pain management guidelines and, and potentially an interactive component can help uh, informing professionals about this. Um, uh, education information sessions uh, and an ongoing discussion about the best approaches, I think could help formulate a consensus. And um, I think the important part there is to make sure that there is a monitoring in addition to the treatment. Uh, we need to use those medications, but then we need to have, we have the obligation to make sure that we, we monitor properly uh, any potential side effects. And lastly, I think, and probably more importantly, uh, aware, the patient groups like SCAGO or like the Sickle Cell Association, uh, the, uh, raising awareness about these issues. And we may not have the answers, but at least you should have the questions. So when you see your healthcare team, have those questions ready for them. And if, even if you're not in a crisis situation, these things are better addressed. Uh, when you're not in a not in a crisis, uh, talk to the team about it, and and have your own team around you, and have your experts, and and kind of have a plan, a treatment plan. How can you manage things when when they just start to emerge? How can you prevent that? And again, that's that's why early awareness, early um, notice of of the warning signs of a crisis or worsening symptoms is important because then you can maybe uh, stem them out early with less medications, less potential uh, side effects. Yeah, and I'll just I'll just follow up here because Karen um, redirected the the the, uh, the the actual question she was asking um, to say that. And Karen, correct me if I'm if I'm misunderstanding again here. The concern, I guess, is that, you know, as we keep sort of adding more and more layers of nuance and, you know, caveats and cautions in the managing of sickle cell disease, we will have more and more clinicians who simply don't want to treat it at all, who say, this is getting too complicated for me. I don't treat sickle cell disease, go somewhere else. Um, and there's just not enough comprehensive treatment centers out there for us to do that, that we do depend upon community uh, hematologists or even general internists or hospitalists to manage this condition. And if we, the question is like, how do we strike that balance between talking about all the many different things that need to be considered and making it seem so complicated that we give people sort of an out to say that, you know, you, you know, this is too hard for me. I just don't treat it at all. Um, I think, I think that's a, that's a broader question, I think maybe, but, uh, the, you know, maybe it's the subject of another, another uh, seminar, but definitely something to think about that, you know, the more sophisticated we become, the, the greater the risk we do of scaring people away or giving them an excuse not to, uh, not to treat sickle cell at all. Um, next question, how much of an effect on the kidney uh, does iron have? Um, similar to, I guess, the, we know that, uh, that iron overload is, is not good for the, the liver. Do we need to worry about this for the kidney as well? So iron deposition can uh, was shown in in the kidney tissue, uh, but uh, but certainly uh, direct or immediate threats to the kidney is probably less uh, from iron overload uh, compared to the liver, and uh, probably it plays a, a much lesser role in in uh, the risk of kidney failure. Okay. Uh, next question: If you have fatty liver. How does that affect your kidneys? Well, fatty liver in itself may not affect the kidney directly. However, fatty liver uh, doesn't come alone. Usually fatty liver uh, comes when there is a, a weight issue, when you're overweight, or when you have risk for diabetes, or you may be diabetic already, or you have something a kind of a pre-diabetes. And all those factors together might uh, actually have an impact on the kidney. Overall, on a, on a basic uh, physiological level, there might be some processes that can pose a potential risk to the kidney on a clinical manifestation, just the fact that you have fat in the liver it may not be an immediate threat. However, importantly, again, fatty liver is an increasingly important cause for kidney uh, for liver failure. So, if you have liver disease that is clinically manifested with symptoms, 
uh, that may have an impact on kidney function uh, in different ways. But more probably more importantly at this point is the, the pre-diabetes and the metabolic syndrome related aspects and the overweight related aspects of fatty liver condition that, that is relevant to kidney health. Okay, thanks very much. Okay, those are all the questions we have in the Q&A queue. Um, I think, I don't know if we could open this up to live questions, if it's possible, if, um, if people want to raise their hand, for example, and then, and then once I call you out, if you wanna just ask your question live to one of our speakers. So we do have one other question, Dr. Pendergrass, okay. from within the chat. Um, oh, I could either read it or it's, you could see it um, in your chat function. Oh, I see it there. Okay. Perfect. Um, okay. So this, thank you for the talk. Uh, two questions for the kidney health section of the talk. First question, hydration is obviously stress for patients with sickle cell anemia. From a kidney perspective, is there any possibility of drinking excess water? For example, is it safe to drink over four liters of water a day? Um, and the second question is, I noted that morphine on the list of pos is on the list of possible nephrotoxins. Is this morphine specifically, or is it all opioids? And in what way are they implicated in kidney damage? So maybe I'll ask the first question, direct that to Dr. Masembe. Um, is there any risk of like drinking too much water for a sickle cell patient? Like if they said that they're drinking over four liters of water a day, is that is that is that too much? Is there a point at which it's you've overdone it? Uh, I don't, I don't think so, but uh, Dr. Istvan can help me with that question. <laughs> okay, so, so uh, I guess uh, uh, an easy answer for everything is it all depends. Uh, although uh, drinking water alone, if you have fluid losses, may not be the ideal thing to do. So if you're losing a lot of fluid, either, either due to heat or excessive sweating from fever or other diarrhea or vomiting, uh, you need to replace the, at least some of the fluid as a more complex fluid and with some of the salts and other uh, components of the fluids that are lost. So drinking, it is possible to drink too much water under few cir some circumstances. Um, we suggest to drink a, a kind of a balanced mix of liquids. Uh, and in a, in a usual setting in Canada, probably two to three liter liquid intake is, is sufficient. Uh, but again, if in the case of crisis, I think uh, that is uh, uh, something that has to be managed in a more controlled setting where uh, some of the fluid replacement needs to happen intravenously. And, and then again, it, it uh, becomes a, a bit of a question of the managing team and monitoring the blood composition. Because if you do too, drink too much liquid, um, uh, you may retain water and then the sodium concentration in your blood can drop and that can lead to uh, significant uh, issues such as even seizures uh, at its extreme. So that, that needs to be considered on a, on a usual kind of daily routine when you're when you're overall okay probably there's no need to drink four liters if you're eating well your kidneys especially the kidneys are healthy they can manage that water load so they can get rid of it and you would excrete a very dilute urine most of it would be urine most of it would be water so normally the kidney would deal with that if you drink four liters of water in certain situations it might become an issue and and probably that's not something that i would suggest as a standard procedure when i said plenty of water on the slide i, I meant around two two and a half liters of water under normal usual circumstances with normal heat normal uh, uh, fluid losses and normal physical activities. Okay, uh, there was a follow-up question um, stating that, you know, setting aside the issue about water intoxication, like hyponatremia and, um, you know, cerebral edema and that sort of thing, is it possible to just hurt the kidneys by sort of overworking them, by just giving them so much fluid that, there's sort of a, there's a there's sort of a, an injury just from the, the amount of urine that you're asking them to make. Yeah, so I think actually, so on the one hand, yes, if the kidney is overworking, that can hurt the kidney. But 
giving them uh, water or enough liquid or too much liquid that may not actually make the kidney overwork because most of the, kid uh, the work that the kidney cells do is not really related to the water uh, man management, it's more related to managing the other toxins. So that, that is one underlying reason why we think that too much protein, not a normal healthy protein intake that uh, on, on average we do about one, 1 1.2 gram of protein per kilo. Uh, if you eat much more than that, that could cause some extra stress uh, on the kidney by making it working extra hard. And that's actually the, uh, the, the same idea is behind this point what I mentioned that initially when you have sickle cell disease, initially the kidneys overwork actually. There is more blood running through the kidneys and that makes the filtration more so that the tubules, the tiny tubes after the kidney, the nephron after the glomerulus will need to work extra hard to retain uh, the stuff that you're filtering out. And that eventually uh, uh, during many years will uh, harm the kidney, but not, not really the liquids. Uh, too much liquids, if the kidneys are not working well, if they cannot get rid of that extra liquid, may be a, an extra work for the heart actually. And that's why there is a bit of a struggle between cardiologist and nephrologist. And there's a bit of a conflict between the kidney and the heart because the heart, especially if the heart is weaker, likes as little volume, as little liquid around as possible to maintain the circulation. Whereas the kidneys, especially under those circumstances, like more liquid around. So this is when we start to give uh, water pills and when it's too much, uh, your kidney function will decline. When it's too little, the heart function will decline and you will retain water. So that's, that's when it becomes an issue about the water, but it's not so much the liquids or the water that is a burden for the kidney. I'll just comment as well. Um, I have a lot of patients who, on my recommendation, drink a lot of fluids every day, particularly when it's hot outside, um, you know, when they're not sleeping well, uh, when they're exercising and, um, and I'd say, and I really push it, especially when they're developing a pain crisis as well. And I've never seen any of those patients get into trouble, um, in terms of injuring their kidneys or going into volume overload or developing hyponatremia. But I have seen countless cases of patients coming into hospital who have an IV started and it's set too high and then left, left running sort of on autopilot for days. And then those patients do go into volume overload. They do you know, end up on oxygen and they, that can sometimes progress to an acute chest syndrome. So I always say, um, if you're able to drink, do that as much as possible, that you should really only be going to an IV if you really cannot drink enough for whatever reason, you know, um, or if you are so, so far behind that it's sort of, you have to hurry to catch up. Uh, Cause it, it is possible for a clinician just to write an IV order and then sort of set it and forget it. And, um, and then before you know it, you poured in like way too much fluid. Uh, the, the second part of that question had to do with the possible nephrotoxic effects of morphine. And the question was, is that just morphine or is that a class effect for all narcotics? Uh it is not as prominent as uh, as for the non steroidals and it it may be a class effect uh but again in the everyday clinical practice that's not something that uh we consider i, I did mention that concern uh it has been listed in a number of papers around management of sickle cell disease but this is the point where actually, which comes back to the questions that if you say that uh, you shouldn't be taking non-steroidals, you cannot get a, a narcotic. So, so what can you do for the pain? Uh, it's always a balance between the risks and the benefits. And for the narcotics and morphine and other uh, uh, narcotic medications, hydromorphone and er er everything else, um, in an acute crisis, the, the potential benefit of managing the pain, preventing further escalation of the situation is significantly high, better or higher weight and it outweighs the, the minimal risk from nephrotoxicity. And in an acute situation, especially if the vol volume status is managed well, uh, we don't see clinical evidence of, of morphine toxicity. Okay, good to know. All right. Um, so I think that is the 
end of all our written questions, unless I'm missing some others elsewhere. Um, uh, Delaney, do you, is it possible to sort of open this up for live questions for anyone who? Absolutely, Dr. Pendergrass. Yep, that seems to be the end of questions that have been submitted by way of the chat and the Q&A. So um, happy to allow folks to raise their hand and identify themselves if, they do, if they'd like to uh, post a question live to our panelists or our moderator, Dr. Pendergrass. Or if there's any question or comment about our website and the resource hub, a suggestion what, what to include, where to go to further advice. So we'll let folks ruminate for a minute or so before uh, potentially transitioning to the closing. Okay, well, certainly if people think of questions after this session, um, they can always, I think that's that hub that's been developed, uh, you know, the, can you, can you just give me the, the website again, one more time of the, uh, that information, have the ACV um, resource that, uh, Gina, you were working on? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the resource hub that we're working on is not, uh, we don't have a, a URL for it yet. Okay. Uh, this this link is for the ACB YouTube channel, uh, which is an active uh, patient and advocate group, patient caregiver, kidney and liver donors, um, and there's a lot of health related and overall uh, information about healthcare and uh, the Black community. So I, I strongly suggest to to check it out. Okay, fantastic. Okay, then. Well, thank you very much. Sounds like we can wrap it up then. All right. So listen, thank you everyone for coming this morning. Thank you so much to our speakers. Um, I certainly learned a lot. Um, I hope you, hope you did too. And um, Delaney, I don't know if we've set a date for the next webinar, uh, or we're just sort of stick with your usual modes of communication to, to know when that's announced. Oh, no, absolutely, Dr. Prendergrass. So our next session will be hosted on August 13th. Uh, we're still confirming some panelists for that session, but it'll be talking about recovery post COVID-19 and the implications that has for members of the sickle cell disease community. So Fantastic. thank you for that uh, alert. Fantastic. Okay. All right. Um, so I think at this point, uh, I will wrap it up. Delaney, do you want to have any sort of final housekeeping before we end the Zoom call? For sure. Just want to let folks know that I've posted the website for sicklecellanemia.ca in the chat, um, and that way, see where you can find the recording for today's session for your future viewing pleasures. So I'll pass these over to you, Dr. Pendergrass, to close. Okay. All right. So listen, it's it's a beautiful day outside. Um, lovely sunny weather. Not so hot that people are going to get dehydrated and <laughs> drink a whole bunch of sugary liquids to wash down their salty food. So a good day for the kidney. You get out there, get some vitamin D, grow those bones and uh, enjoy, the, enjoy the summer. Okay, thanks for coming today. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you to Thank you. Dr. Mucci, Algina, Dr. Masembe, and the health, Kidney Health and Education Research Group. Really appreciate it. And thank you to all our attendees. Have a great, okay. wonderful Saturday. You all too, bye-bye. Right. All right, take care. And thank you so much, Dr. Pennygrass. Great moderation. <laughs>